Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Genesis. We are concluding this week by uh, starting in chapter 29, which is where we left off last week, and trying to get all the way through chapter 50. And so, uh, the Lord willing, we will give a summary of what we have covered in depth for uh, many weeks now. Very important summary. It's the book of beginnings. Every major doctrine that is found in the Word of God first appears in the book of Genesis. Even the doctrines of the cross for Genesis 3.15, the proto-evangelium of the gospel, the promise that God would send a redeemer given to Adam and Eve right after they sinned in the garden. All the way through the doctrine of homardiology, sin, angelology, the doctrine of angels, demonology, the doctrine of demons and of Satan. It doesn't matter what division of scripture you go into, soteriology, eschatology, or what have you, you will discover 
that the roots of it and the foundation of it is found in the book of Genesis. God introduces in Genesis every other doctrine that he elaborates on throughout the remainder of scripture. And thus Genesis is a very important book. And one of the key things that we discover in the book of Genesis is how he deals with his people in grace. We've just sung about that uh, infinite, marvelous grace of God. People who are wicked sinners, people who have turned their backs on God, people who try to make bargains with God, people who lie to God, people who lie to one another, people who commit immoral acts, people who commit murder. We find all of that in the book of Genesis and we find God dealing with them in a gracious manner. So truly theology proper finds a, a, a huge footing as we have gone through this magnificent book. Now you recall last time as we were finishing up in chapter 29, Isaac has blessed Jacob, he sent him off to Padan Aram to find a wife. God restates his Abrahamic covenant to Jacob on the way there. Jacob sets up a pillar at Bethel and promises that if God will bring him safely back home, then he'll serve God. Jacob, again, trying to cut a, a covenant with God on his own terms rather than on God's terms. We saw Jacob coming to Haran. Uh, we find him uh, meeting Rachel, the daughter of Laban. Uh, we find him falling in love with Laban. Excuse me, he didn't fall in love with Laban. He fell in love with Rachel. Laban, no. Uh, Laban was the taskmaster that made him work for seven years for the daughter Rachel and then deceived him and gave him Leah instead. And then we find he works seven more years so that he can have Rachel. And we find that during that period of time, Leah bears four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, and Rachel is barren. And so we get to chapter 30 today, which is where we pick up. And we find that Rachel, in her jealousy, because all during this period of time, these 14 years that are going by, God is giving children to her sister, but she who was the, the promised bride and who got shoved on the shelf by her father, she has no children and how jealous she is. And so Rachel begins to act like the world in chapter 30. How many times do we as Christians act like the world? Because there was this custom back then that you could take your maid and give it to your husband if you didn't have children and when the maid brought forth children, then they would be considered your children if they were born on your knees. And so, Jake, the jealous Rachel gives Jacob her maid Bilhah to wife, and then Bilhah gives birth to Dan and Naphtali. And so Leah, because she realizes this is a contest here, who's going to be the favorite wife, she has stopped bearing herself, and so she gives Zilpah to Jacob as a wife, and then Zilpah gives birth to Gad and Asher. And then we find Leah bearing two more sons, Issachar and Zebulun, and a daughter by the name of Dinah. And then finally, God hears Rachel's petition, and she gives birth to Joseph. So at that point, Jacob says, okay, I've got what I need, I want to get out of here. And so Jacob asks to be released from the services of Laban. But Laban does not want to give up Jacob that easily. He sees that God has blessed him as a result of Jacob's work. Laban, who is an idolater, as we discover later on in the passage, Laban understands that Jacob has a God who actually blesses him, not like the little stone idols that, that he keeps. And so he bargains with Jacob. He says, what do you want to get paid? And I will give it to you. So Jacob, who has been tending these sheep for... Uh, good long period of time, 14 years at this point, says, well, I tell you what, uh, if you give me all of the speckled and spotted and ring straight sheep, uh, let that be my wages. Any solid color sheep that you find in my flock, consider that to be stolen. Just give me these ones that are speckled and spotted and ring straight. Laban says, oh, I like that deal. And so what he does is he first goes through the flock and he takes out all the ring straight, speckled and spotted sheep and figures Jacob's not going to get many of those from what he's now going to be tending. But of course, God blesses Jacob. God is the God of genetics, too. God is a God who has built into the various flocks and herds and uh, groups of animals around the world an incredible genetic diversity. And that is so from the beginning. 
even more genetically diverse back at creation than these limited populations that we see now. And God blesses Jacob and begins to prosper Jacob. And those animals which were part of the bargain, suddenly Jacob's flocks are bigger and they are stronger than the flocks that Laban has. And so after six years, with Jacob getting richer and Laban getting poorer, Laban's sons begin to complain. That brings us to chapter 31. And Jacob calls Leah and Rachel into the field and explains the situation and tells them, you know, I've lost favor in the sight of your father and brothers, and if we don't get out of here pretty soon and do it secretly, we're all in serious trouble. Of course, he's only thinking of himself uh, because those are Laban's daughters, and they would inherit all that Jacob has, and suddenly he would be much richer than he ever was before if he merely removes Jacob. And so when Laban leaves to shear his sheep, Jacob and his entire family and their flocks sneak away. It says they steal away. It's the way the text puts it. Laban hears about it, out where he is, shearing sheep, and he pursues Jacob with a large company of men. Jacob always seems to be running from something. Very soon he's going to be running into a company of men that he really doesn't want to meet. But here he is fleeing from Laban. Laban pursues him to Mount Gilead. But the night before he actually makes contact with Jacob, God tells him, don't touch Jacob. Laban knows this is the God that has blessed Jacob. Laban knows that this is the God who can do something serious to him if he disobeys. And so the next morning, he complains to Jacob that Jacob has stolen his household gods. He probably had that in the back of his mind also as the real God appears to him and tells him not to hurt Jacob because he thinks, I don't have even my household gods, the ones that I usually rely on to protect me. They've disappeared when Jacob left. They disappeared. And so Jacob, when he hears that story, says, all right, pronounces a death penalty on whoever stole the household gods, not knowing that it was his beloved wife, Rachel, who stole them. Yes, she was Jacob's wife, and Jacob was the heir of the promises from the God of heaven, but she still had those connections to the things of the world. How difficult it is for God's people to get the things of the world out of us. There are things probably in each of our lives that are like the household gods that Rachel stole. Things that will hold us back from serving the true and living God. And so Laban begins to search, and he goes from tent to tent to tent, and he can't find the gods because Rachel lies, says she is going through her monthly time, and so she's sitting on this camel's bag in which she has hidden the gods, and she says to her dad, I can't get up. So he finds them not. He comes back out. Jacob goes through a tirade as to why have you searched everything. And finally, Jacob and Laban swear an oath together that they will not pass that point to do harm one to the other as long as they both live. And Laban goes home. Then we move to chapter 32 and we find that God is clearly directing in the life of Jacob because here the angels of God meet Jacob at a place called Machanaim, which is two troops is what it means in Hebrew. Two groups of angels, two bands of angels that meet Jacob as he is on his way back home, reminding him that God is always present, though not always visible. God's angels are always present, though not always visible, and they are there for his protection. And so Jacob sends a message to Esau in Mount Seir, saying, I'm returning home. And then he gets a message back, Esau is marching toward you with 400 men. Not a friendly sign. Jacob is afraid. He divides his family and possessions into two bands. Then he sends a five-part present to Esau. A band of goats, a band of sheep, a band of milk camels, a herd of bulls and cows, a band of male and female donkeys. And he tells each of the drivers of these groups, which are separated by some distance, when you reach my brother Esau, and he says, what are these? You say, these are a present to my lord Esau from your servant Jacob. And so by the time that Esau comes, Jacob hopes that this will change Esau's attitude of bitterness against him. For Esau had been cheated, you remember, by Jacob out of material things. And so Jacob is using material things to appease his brother. And then that night, Jacob wrestles with the angel of the Lord. That's a theophany there. It's very clear from the passage that is God himself himself 
in the second person of the Godhead, what's called a Christophany, the appearance of Christ before the Incarnation in the Old Testament. He wrestles all night, and he refuses to let go until he receives a blessing. And so the Lord says, all right, I'll give you a blessing, but it's going to cost you something. And he cripples Jacob, and Jacob, from that point on, hobbles upon a staff. But some very exciting things happen, because now Jacob and Esau reconcile in chapter 33. Jacob introduces his family. Esau offers to accompany Jacob home, and Jacob refuses. Jacob fails to go the full way. Instead of returning all the way back to Isaac, he pitches his tents at a place called Shalem, very close to a group of very wicked and pagan people. And that brings us to Genesis chapter 34, one of the very sad chapters of the book of Genesis. In chapter 34, we find a pagan young man by the name of Shechem, defiling Dinah, the daughter of Leah, <coughs> and then he wants to marry her. Oh, she had gone out to see the daughters of the land. Dear friends, how dangerous it is to have our children in such close proximity with those who are not believers. She's defiled. But Shechem is an honorable young man. He wants to marry her, so he sends his father Hamor to ask Jacob to let Dinah marry him. Dinah's brothers and Jacob all are very angry that Shechem has defiled Dinah. So they pretend to agree to intermarry with the people of Shalem, but only if the men will be circumcised. So the men of Shalem agree, <coughs> and they are circumcised. And while they are incapacitated, Dinah's brothers Simeon and Levi go into the city and kill all of the men, and then all of the sons go into the city and plunder the city. Jacob is rather upset. He says, you've made me stink in the nostrils of the inhabitants of the land. And they say, well, should this man treat our sister like a harlot? So we find... Genesis 35, God appears to Jacob and tells him to move to Bethel. And there to build an altar, and Jacob obeys. But first Jacob realizes he has to deal with a very serious family issue. <coughs> he has to deal with the issue of will there be one God or many gods in my family. His failure to obey God has cost him a great deal in chapter 34. And so now he tells his family that they must get rid of all their false god images and they bury them under an oak tree. I've often wondered why they didn't burn them. We find that's what the believers did in the New Testament with all their books of witchcraft. Burying them implies the possibility of coming back to those things. And how often we don't want to completely get rid of the evil things that are in our lives want to make the possibility of coming back, not burn all of our bridges behind us. But they bury them under the oak, and they never come back. What a blessing that was to that family. And as they flee, God causes the pagans to fear them as they're moving on, and when they get to Bethel, Jacob builds the altar, God reminding him of the promise that he made so many years ago, more than 20 years before that, as he was on his way to Padan Aram. And then we find after he builds the altar, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, dies and is buried at Bethel. It's here, finally, when Jacob gets back to the point where he left the land. It is here that God changes Jacob's name to Israel and reinstates the Abrahamic covenant to him. And then immediately after that, Rachel gives birth to Benjamin and dies and is buried in Ephrath, which is the ancient name for Bethlehem. You know, many times, folks, we make hasty statements and God fulfills them. You remember what Jacob had said when Laban caught him and said, Why did you steal my gods? And he says, well, you can put to death anybody who stole the gods. Rachel gives birth to Benjamin and dies. Be careful what you say. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, 
Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For with thy words thou shalt be justified, and with thy words thou shalt be condemned. James tells us that the tongue is an unruly evil, very difficult to control. He says, if you can control your tongue, you're a perfect man, a mature man. If you can control the things that you say, Every part of the body is easy to control, but the tongue is like the rudder on a ship. It turns that huge ship every which way. Be careful what you say. And then immediately after that, we have another family crisis. Reuben commits adultery with Bilhah, and Jacob hears of it. And so finally, finally Jacob does what he was supposed to do. He returns to Isaac, his father at Hebron. God has allowed Isaac to live all of these years. Okay, the mother's dead, but the father's still alive. He's 180 years old. And after Jacob returns, Isaac dies and is buried by Esau and Jacob. These are crisis chapters as this man returns into fellowship with God. There are many emotional experiences that come in to crush him along the way. But God is using it to develop in Jacob a character of more faith. And then we leave in chapter 6, 36, excuse me, uh, the line of Jacob for a moment. Chapter 36 is a list of all of Esau's descendants by his multiple wives, all of whom were pagans. And then we move to Genesis chapter 37, and it starts out with young Joseph at age 17, the one who is the beloved son of Jacob, who has just received a coat of many colors, and the brothers hate him for it. And then we find immediately at the beginning of that chapter, Joseph has two dreams that show his parents and brothers will sometime bow down to him. The dream of the sheaves and the dream of the stars. And the brothers hate him even more. And so the brothers go off to feed the flocks in Shechem. Very interesting. That's the place where they killed the men of Shalem. It's almost like criminals returning to the scene of the crime and about to commit another serious crime. Oh, how our sins keep drawing us back and pulling us back when we have not confessed them and repented of them and turned to God for forgiveness. How they keep drawing us back to the same place. And so Jacob wants to know how his sons are doing. Joseph has gotten to stay home, of course, as the brothers go out to feed the flocks. But Jacob sends Joseph to look for them and he tracks them all the way to Dothan. The brothers see him coming. They also see a, a caravan of Ishmaelites and Midianites traveling by. And first they want to kill him, and then they decide, why should we kill him when we can make some money off of him? They throw him into a pit, and when the caravan gets there, they sell him. And then they take his coat of many colors. That symbol of everything they hated about him. And they rip it to shreds, and they dip it in blood, and take it back. To Jacob and said, we can't really tell whether or not this is Joseph's coat, but you know, we found it out in the wilderness looking like this. What do you think? And Jacob believes their lie and enters a huge period of mourning for Joseph. And then we enter Joseph's story in chapter 39. Joseph is sold to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. Joseph is a diligent and faithful slave, even though he had been a favored son. You know, it reminds us of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the Son of heaven, becoming a slave here. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, which indeed was a death covered with blood, like the blood on the coat of Joseph. We saw, as we studied the life of Joseph, many parallels between his life and the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we find he goes down to Egypt and is sold as a slave to the captain of Potiphar's guard. 
I skipped over Genesis 38. You know the story of Judah being out of fellowship, marrying a Canaanite, having three sons, two of whom are killed by God for their wickedness. Judah failing to, the one who is the progenitor of the Messiah, failing to give his third son to this widow who has married his first two boys. She, acting as a prostitute, seduces Judah, who does not know who she is. He gives her a, a sign to guarantee that he will pay her. He gives her signet ring, bracelets, and staff. And then, when he goes back to pay her, or sends his friend back to pay her, she's not there. Three months later, they discover she's pregnant. Judah says, well, you know, she's committed fornication. Take her out and burn her to death. She says, the man by whom I am pregnant is the owner of these three things. And Judah admits his sin and repents. She bears twin boys, Pharaoh and Zerah, they're born. Both end up in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the grace of God, people. That is the utter grace of God. To take these two illegitimate children born by incest from Judah himself and place them in the line of the Messiah. Do you understand the grace of God? Do you understand the grace of God? To you and to me, vile and filthy sinners, to bring us into his own family, to redeem us with the precious blood of his Son. Oh, we'll be celebrating that shortly. Dear people, Genesis is a book of grace. And then we find the temptations that come to a young man who's a believer. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. He refuses. She lies about him. Joseph is thrown into prison. The prison keeper promotes Joseph to take care of all the other prisoners. And we move to chapter 40. Here we find Joseph still in prison, interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh's butler and baker. They're both in prison because they've offended Pharaoh. And they happen, those dreams, just as Joseph said they would. Three days later, the butler is restored to his position and hands the cup to Pharaoh. And three days later, on that same day, Pharaoh's birthday, the baker is hanged. But the butler forgets to tell Pharaoh about Joseph, who continues to sit in the prison. Oh, how often we rely on other people but the arm of man will always fail you. God is in control. God knows the right timing. God knows what he's doing in Joseph's life. Joseph may not understand it, but he spends two more years in prison. Falsely accused. We move to chapter 41. Two years later, Pharaoh dreams two dreams. He dreams first about seven fat cows being eaten up by seven lean cows. Horrible cows, bad cows that come out of the river and eat up the other cows. A grotesque thought for a dream. And then he dreams again, and he dreams the seven full ears of corn are eaten up by seven wind-blasted lean ears of corn, and they don't become any fatter after eating them. And so the next morning he, he goes and he tells his magicians, he tells his wise men, but they cannot interpret the dream, and suddenly the butler remembers Joseph in prison. God's timing is always right. And so Joseph is brought out of prison and he explains to Pharaoh what the dreams mean and also gives God the glory. You will notice that both Joseph and Daniel in the book of Daniel, when he explains the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, always points the one to whom they are explaining the dream, always points them to God. It's not because of anything that's in me. It's because there is a living God who reveals what he is going to do to Pharaoh. And after he explains it, Pharaoh appoints Joseph the second in command in Egypt. Joseph marries Asnath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. Joseph stores up the food during the seven years of plenty. And when the years of famine begin at the end of chapter 41, Joseph begins to sell food both to the Egyptians and foreigners. And all through this, you see the sovereign hand of God. Oh, what another great theme of the book of Genesis. Regardless of what people are doing here on earth, regardless of how bad they get, God is in control. Absolute, sovereign control. 
And God has been moving the pieces on the board in such a way that those prophetic dreams that he gave to Joseph at age 17 are going to be fulfilled. And so we move now into chapter 42, and Joseph's brothers, except for Benjamin, are forced to come to Egypt to buy food. You know, it's oftentimes in those times of spiritual leanness where we begin to have pain in our soul like they had pain in their bellies. So those times that God begins to move us and draw us and irresistibly force us to where we must be back in the center of his will. And so he does it with the brothers here. And Joseph recognizes them and he treats them roughly and puts them to a test. And he tells them, you're spies. I know why you came to Egypt. You didn't come down to buy food. You came down to see if we were weak so that all of you wild people up there in that northern part of the country would come down here and attack Egypt. They say, no, 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 we're not spies. We're, uh, we're brothers. And, and you know, there are 12 of us and one of them's dead and one of them's back home. The little guy, he's back home with dad. Oh, how they rude telling Joseph that. Of course, he already knew it. But he says, all right, if you're true men, I'll take one of you. I'll put him in prison here. Give him a little taste of the Joseph experience. And so he takes Simeon and he says to the rest of them, go home, take your bags of food, head on back to the land, you know, greet your dad, and when you have to come back for food again next time, bring your youngest brother. Because if you don't, you will never see Simeon again. And then he tells his steward, take their money, stick it back in the mouth of their sacks. He obviously doesn't need their money. But Joseph is also a man of grace because he serves a God of grace. They go, they eat all the food up, and then we get to the end of chapter 42, and there they are, they have no more food. God caused it, the famine, to last long enough to where they used up everything they had. Again. How many times do we have to go through cycles like this before we listen to the true and living God and confess our sins and turn back into the ways of righteousness? They probably thought, well, the famine can't last much longer. We'll go ahead and eat like normal. It doesn't say this in the text, but I suspect that they went back to eating just like normal. Instead of trying to conserve what they had, they thought there must be an, another year at least that we would get some rain and get some crops. But it doesn't happen. And so we move into chapter 43 at this point. And the famine is sore in the land and everything is used up. And, you know, Jacob says, well, you've got to go back to Egypt and buy some more. And Judah reminds him, he says, look, that man down there told us that if we don't bring Benjamin the next time we come, he won't see us and he won't give us any food. It's a wasted trip. And Judah promises himself a surety at that point. What a transformation from chapter 40, uh, 38 to chapter 43. 38, Judah in utter immorality. Chapter 43, Judah offering himself as a surety for Benjamin. A total heart change in those five chapters there. And so we find that Jacob pronounces a blessing in verse 14. God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your older other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And so they, they come down with their little present to Jacob. And how often we come thinking that somehow we're going to gain favor with God, merit God's goodness by what we bring to him. Joseph, they don't realize his heart is a heart of grace. His heart is a heart of forgiveness. His heart is a heart of mercy. He didn't need their little present in order to be gracious to them. But they didn't understand grace. And how many who are sitting in church pews today also do not understand grace. And so they come in and he sets a feast for them. They are very surprised by this. He restores Simeon to them. But he, he spreads a big banquet. He sits separately at one end 
where there's a separate table for him and the brothers are seated all in the proper birth order and they marvel at that. How did he know which one of us is oldest and how did he know which one of us is youngest? Now he could guess the youngest one, of course, because that was the brother they hadn't brought and they told him that that was youngest and he gives him five times as much food as all the other brothers to see whether or not they will still be jealous of this younger brother as they were of him. Joseph tests them all the way through. How many times does God have to test us? Our motives, our hearts, the purposes that we have for what we do and what we say. We move to chapter 44. And he tells the steward of his house again, All right, fill their sacks to the full. Get every grain in there that you possibly can. Give them their money back. Stick it back in their sacks. And take my cup, my silver cup, a cup that would have weighed about the same amount of silver as the betrayal money for our Lord, as we saw when we studied the text. Oh, we see so many connections between Joseph and Jesus and the redemption and the cup. And so as they leave the city, he sends his servant after them and he says, say to, the, say to them when you reach them, my Lord has been so good to you. Why did one of you guys steal my cup? And they say, well, we'll, we'll check it quick. They drop their sacks to the ground. He goes through all the sacks. He gets to Benjamin's sack. And he pulls out the cup. And they say, oh, we'll all go back and be my Lord's servant. He said, no, go back, feed your families. This is the man I'll have for my servant. We can't do that. Our father will die if we don't bring Benjamin back. And so they follow the steward back to the house as he is taking Benjamin prisoner back to Joseph. But instead of abandoning him, abandoning him as they did with Joseph, they follow. Oh, their desire is not to bring any more pain to their father. Their desire now is to somehow find release for their brother. And they come in and Judah makes his petition. And he begs for the life of Benjamin. He says, take me instead. Finally, we get to chapter 45, and Joseph can't restrain himself before them anymore, and he, he shouts in Egyptian, cause every man to go out from me, and all the Egyptians run out of the room, don't know what's going to happen at this point. Joseph breaks down before his brothers and speaks to them in Hebrew, and says, don't you know who I am? I'm your brother Joseph. And they're shocked. Little did they understand as they were going through this testing process that Joseph was running them through that this was a man who still loved them. Would you love those who had done these things to you? Would you still want to show mercy to those who had done things like that to you? Would you still act toward those who had brutally treated you with grace? when you are in the up position and they are in the down position? What we learn of grace as we look at the story of Joseph. And then he tells them, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves. You sold me, but God did send me. Oh, I love that verse. You sold me, but God did send me before you to preserve life. In chapter 45, he gives to them the land of Goshen. He sets them up with an interview with Pharaoh. Pharaoh gives them all that they have to need. And Joseph sends a message back. Father, I am still alive. Israel, for so he is called at that point, Israel is overwhelmed. But he says, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. And so in chapter 46, we find the journey. And all of the family of Jacob comes with him. It's referred to in Acts chapter 7. It's a very important uh, item in the history of Israel. Find it in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. And we find God speaks to Israel again in the visions of the night. And we find a restatement not only of the Abrahamic covenant, but we find a restatement of God being with him in Egypt and then bringing ultimately his descendants back to the land 
of promise. And so they come down into Egypt. Joseph's wife bears him two sons while they're there. And now we find in chapter 47 the placement of the people of Israel in the land of Goshen. We find that Jacob lives in the land of Egypt 17 more years, the same amount of time that Joseph had been down in Egypt. And then we find Jacob dies, 147 years old, when he passes into the presence of the Lord. Oh, the agony of his journey, but the glory of his final reception. And then we find Joseph petitions Pharaoh that he might bury his father again. What a tense situation that might have been. We talked about the political implications of it. We find the prophecies that Jacob gave in chapter 49. We find the burial of Joseph in chapter 50. End of chapter 50. He's 110 years old. The book that begins, in the beginning, God, four words, the last four words of the book, a coffin in Egypt. Let those who are wise be instructed. In the beginning, God. A coffin in Egypt. What will you put in your life? Between the first and last verses, all the doctrines are there, all the wicked practices are there, and all the righteous practices are there. And you who are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, what will your life declare between that point at which God created you and the point that you are placed in a coffin in the ground? It's not enough to know the truth. We must live the truth. And God has enabled us so to do by the power of his Holy Spirit who indwells every man, woman, boy, and girl who has trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. As the scripture asks the question, how shall we then live? Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the power of your word and for the practical implications of it. It is a rich doctrinal book. It is so much joy to study it in depth and see the meaning of words and see the interrelation between the doctrines, to understand your sovereignty and your glory, even if we only scratch the surface of those things, for it is so much deeper than we as human beings can ever understand. But how your word also declares to us how we shall live. Those of us who have named the name of Jesus Christ, those of us who are empowered by the Spirit of God, those of us who have the eternal instruction book of God's own hand, the Bible, how shall we then live? Father, we thank you for this study that we've had in Genesis. We pray that you will bless it to our hearts, to the glory of your Son, our Savior. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.